Hi, my name's Hugo. I recently went to a rock climbing training workshop and Lee Cossey gave a talk about finger injuries in rock climbers. Lee is a legendary climber, as an Australian Ninja Warrior finalist, and he runs his own physiotherapy clinic in Blue Mountains. Here's Lee. Okay, so for those of you who I don't know, I'm Lee. Um, I'm a climber, obviously, that's why I'm here on a Sunday. Um, well, actually, it doesn't make that much sense. Anyway, I'm also a physiotherapist and I'm also a climbing coach. Um, I've been climbing for about 25 years. I started when I was 12. Um, in that time, I've kind of done a lot of competitions, sport climbing, new routing, bouldering, big wall climbing, chad climbing, like tried to kind of, well, not tried to, but I've enjoyed doing a little bit of everything. Um, I now own and run Move Clinic, which is a physiotherapy and exercise physiology clinic in Katoomba in the Blue Mountains. Um, we see a huge variety of different patients and clients, you know, a lot of people with lifestyle diseases, but then we also see a great deal of climbers. And so we're managing their acute injuries, we're trying to prevent future injuries with those that are kind of overcoming something acute, or we're coaching people to start to perform better. My interest in in physio basically stemmed from my own curiosity about my own injuries as a teenager, which I had one really significant one, which involved like two large blocks of time off climbing. Um, and at that age, when I was 15 and 16, in each, each year I had three months off. It's a really, really big thing. So it basically got me thinking a lot about, you know, how does the body work and how can I not lose time to climbing anymore? Um, the other big thing that sort of pushed me into that professional direction is my passion for training and you know trying to work out how to train as smart as I could and become as strong as possible or as good as possible. It's not all about getting strong. Training smart is about recognizing what you need to be able to do to get from A to B on a climb and that isn't just strength, that's being generally awesome. Okay. Um, Today I want to talk to you about one very, very small detail of the work that I do, which is finger injuries. Has anyone had or got a finger injury at the moment? Yes, you can see the slightly older people in the crowd, okay? All right, so yeah, they're, they're really common. If I see maybe, let's say if I see a few climbers in a day, generally half of the climbers that I'll see will be seeing me for finger injuries. Of those that are adolescents, half of them are seeing me for an adolescent specific injury which I'm going to go through and Justine's already touched on, okay? Um, we're going to talk about, whoa, yeah, we're going to talk about things that contribute to finger injuries which are how we grip, okay? We're then going to talk about those kind of two major injuries, the ones that happen a little more in adults and the ones that happen a little bit more in kids. We're going to talk about the anatomy that's specific to that. Um, we're also going to talk then about how training can either be something that makes us more likely to be injured or something that makes us less likely to be injured and heaps stronger, okay? Same thing, but it can go two ways, all right? Um, to start with though, does anyone know why we get injured? Like if we think about like, what is it? What causes injury? Any injury, not just fingers, yep. Too much, that's absolutely brilliant, yep. But what's too much? What's too much? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So relative to what we have been doing, doing more, more than what the body's used to. But then if we think, how do I get better? I've got to do more. That's true, but it's about taking small steps. Anyone else? Any other reasons why we get injured? Totally, the nuts and bolts of it is that shit breaks. That's pretty much the definition of an injury. Either it breaks or it's saying, hold your horses, pull back, okay? So there, when we think about injury, often general person's def definition of injury is something hurts. That can fall into two categories. Something has broken, it's a structural failure, or something's become sensitive to give you a message. Both of them hurt, but for different reasons. And Justine touched on, on that, you know, pain being a mechanism that's generated in the brain. But yeah, things break because we do too much. There's lots of ways to do too much. And so this concept, right? We have, our body is like a bucket. It can handle an absolute heap of load. 
we can push it really, really hard and it will continue to adapt and we can continue to get stronger. But once we fill that bucket, that's when things start to get problematic, all right? So we have this bucket of resilience or bucket of tolerance. The things that go into it, okay, repetition. And that's not, you know, reps on a wall. This is like the repetition of a particular type of something. So I've got repetition of just climbing and training. So volume, just how much we do. Repetition of the hold type, okay? So if we train only on pinches or only on crimps, that also starts to fill that bucket pretty rapidly and doesn't leave a lot of space for other things, okay? As opposed to hold type, grip strategy, okay? If we crimp every hold, so if we crimp the pinches and we crimp the crimps and we crimp the slopers, that is another form of repetition that fills this bucket rapidly. Um, so that would be where we were dependent on one particular grip strategy, hence it then becomes repetitive. The other one, which we don't often think of, is movement style, okay? There are no inherently bad movement styles. They're, basically, they're all skills, and we want all of those tools, okay? So we want to be able to move statically, we want to be able to move dynamically, we want to be able to um, generate force quickly, do it slowly, depending on what the move requires, but dependence on a particular movement style is another way we can fill that bucket really quickly. Okay, the other big ones is the rate of load increase. So I said before, we need to train more and harder to get better and to continually stimulate the body. But unless, but if we do that too quickly, bingo, this starts to fill up very quickly. This increase makes the bucket bigger over a period of time. It, we can't speed that up, okay? Poor nutrition, makes it makes that bucket smaller essentially poor rest poor sleep those sort of things reduce how much space there is in that bucket to load it with good quality training um inconsistent training is another one too much rest is not good for the body justine mentioned that as well and that is that if we have a week of doing nothing then we train super hard then we have a week of doing nothing that is a you know a missed opportunity to create resilience in the body okay um yeah, that's and then bad luck. But I'm going to talk about bad luck at the end because injuries do happen. Adam Andre's examples, uh, bad luck. Okay, but we can also have bad luck on the climbing wall. We can have bad luck with a finger, and these things happen. Okay, it's more about how it's handled when that happens. All right. By all means, butt in um, if you've got any questions or if you feel like I'm talking too quickly. Um, all right. So I said we're going to talk about grip strategy. All right. So. Does everyone know how, like, I guess, how we describe the types of grips that we use? Can, can someone tell me a, a grip strategy? Exactly, a drag. So Pete said a drag. So a drag or an open grip, that would fit into what is generally, you know, considered an open grip position, okay? Then, what's next? It is up here, but anyway, it's good to know what people would, understand what people know all right we move to something where we start to become less open okay and so that might look like something like that the half crimp okay and where we change from being open to a half crimp is that the at the end of the day the fingertips need to sort of sit perpendicular to the ground or at least in line with the holding surface okay and that can be achieved with bend at that joint and at that joint being an open grip or as we move away from that the distal or the last joint there is still in the same position, but it's all a product of bend at this joint, okay? So that is moving toward a more closed grip or what we generally consider a half crimp, okay? And so that would be a classic half crimp, okay? Bend at that joint, not here, not there, okay? From there, we go to a full crimp, okay? And that is where we start to add bend at the knuckle of the hand, and that's it there, okay? All right, so those are the fundamental grip positions that we employ whenever we hold anything, okay? Depending, regardless of the hold type. So whether it's a pinch, a pocket, blah, 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 jug, sloper, we are using some iteration of open, half crimp, or full crimp, okay? Um, pinches, the only reason I put that on this side is that it's employing the thumb in a different way. But still, we can pinch open, we can pinch half crimp, Pretty hard to pinch in a crimp, but we can do a very, very high pinch, and that would be, in my books, a crimp without the thumb, but rather the thumbs on the rock. 
Okay, so just some definitions there. The reason I wanted to talk about grip strategy is because it has a lot to do with, um, you know, the way in which injuries occur. The important take home message of this is that all grips are okay in moderation because all grips are necessary for different types of holds. Okay, so we need to create resilience and familiarity with all of those grips. And also we want to be, aim to be strong at all of them so that we don't become dependent on one particular grip strategy, which can then become repetitive and then fill that bucket faster. Okay, um, cool. Any questions on grip strategies at all? Or grip positions? Can you put your hands up or your hand up if you have ever heard of a grip type being bad? Yep, we've got a few hands. I will hint or I'll guess that that was a crimp. Full crimp being defined as as bad, yep, okay. But we watch the World Cup boulder comps, we watch the World Cup league comps, we watch Adam Andra on his hardest route. That thumb is wrapped on certain holds. We can't disregard that. That is a part of hard climbing and we can't neglect it. If we neglect it, we're creating vulnerability, okay. So, moving on, we have anatomy. This is this is as scientific as I want to get, okay, and it's simplified quite a lot, as hopefully a few of you will kind of already recognize. This is a finger on an edge. Does that, can everyone see that? I'll put these up later and you can kind of have a bit of a look around and you can take pictures of them later up close if you want. Okay, this is a finger, a single finger in a half crimp position, okay. No real reason I chose a half crimp position, um, it, just, it just works, okay. Um, the things that I want you to focus on, this bone is the last bone in the hand, okay? All right, that bone is the first finger, sorry, the first bone in the finger, that one, the second, and that one, the tip, okay? The joint here that's bent at 90 degrees is that one, hence we can see the relevance to a half crimp position. So that's the bones and that's the position, okay? Where each of those bones ends and meets another, we have a joint, makes sense. Um, really really important is this orange line here that's one of our two flexor tendons okay we actually have two one stops here one goes to the end doesn't actually matter for what we're talking about here when this is pulled on by the muscle way down in the forearm the fingers close all right the stronger we are here the smaller that hole can be and the poorer the feet can be the stronger the muscles here more likely the harder we're going to climb okay but the stronger the muscles are here the more load we get placed on this whole system here, okay? So, more risk of injury comes with climbing harder, but more strength in the structures comes with being stronger, all right? It's about the rate of loading. So, I'm going to just jump forwards one sec, and we're going to talk about oh, one, one more structure. These little tunnels, they are our pulleys, okay? And so, they are what restrain the flexor tendon. So, when we're holding on here, this very, very tensioned piece of cable isn't just making a beeline for the wrist, okay? We'll come back to those little pulleys, but... All right, jumping forward a second, we are going to forget the finger for a moment. Okay, does this bone look familiar? It's like a cartoon bone, okay? All right, this is what you see in all the cartoons. Every dog has a bone like this, all right? This one is the bone of an adult. And let's just take, say for a moment, these are x-rays of a bone of an adult and a bone of, a of, a, of an adolescent, okay? All right, we'll talk about age in a moment. On the x-ray of the adult bone, it looks complete. It looks like, yep, that's good. We, we've got a strong bone here. When we look at the x-ray of the adolescent, it looks like it's not connected, all right? There's a big fat gap here and a gap there, and that is completely invisible on the x-ray, as invisible as the skin and invisible as the muscles. The thing is though, that that whole bone is very, very strong. The reason it's not visible is because this point here is what we call a growth plate, okay? And it's, it's not got calcium in it, hence it doesn't show up on an x-ray, but it is still extremely strong. So it's cartilage, and it's, um, it's the point at which the bones are lengthening. So this bone still has some length to gain, Okay, and so it grows from, from that edge in that direction and from this edge in that direction. That's how we get longer bones, not from the very, very ends, okay? So hence they're called growth plates, the plate at which we grow. 
Okay, the thing to understand here is that despite it being super strong, it doesn't have as much tolerance to repetitious load. Okay, all right. When we load these really repetitiously, we can end up with fractures. Okay, so either the blood supply to that area is reduced because usually the heaviest blood supply comes into the middle of the bone. So it doesn't go out here, that's rare. Okay, the big one that happens is that that end of bone, which we'll talk about on the finger, breaks, all right? And that usually doesn't happen in a single incident with young climbers, it usually happens with repetition. Okay, and it's usually going back to that repetition I was talking about, it's repetition of a particular type of thing, it's not load as a whole per se, okay? So that's why we really want to make sure that we vary the way in which we do it. Okay, so are there any boys under the age of 18 here? We've got a few? Yep. So it's very, very safe bet that you guys won't have a fully developed um, bones yet, okay? More than likely would have open growth plates, okay? So this applies to you guys. Any girls under the age of 16, 17? Yep, there's a few, okay. So again, it's a little bit different for girls. Sometimes it can happen a bit earlier, but from a climbing physio's point of view and a coach's point of view, I pretty much, you know, work on the conservative side of things and I would put you in this category of being like at some risk of growth plate fracture, okay? And it's not like this happens overnight. That reduces over a period of time. Um, okay, jumping back here, we're gonna talk about growth plate injuries in the finger. All right, so I've got little dotted lines. Can everyone see those dotted lines? Okay, these are the growth plates in our fingers, all right? The one that I'm gonna focus on is here, okay? In this position, okay, we're pushing down on the rock. Do we agree on that? Yep. Another way we could look at it is the rock is pushing up on us. Semantics, physicists' problems. Okay, the, um, the thing that we wanna think about here is that, okay, so we push down there by putting tension on this, but that tension creates other issues. So wherever there's tension, but we're not going anywhere, there needs to then be some compression, okay? All right, so we have this sort of joint here which bears most of the compression of this, okay? And if we've got all of our body weight suspended on one hand on an edge, which I'm sure some of you guys can probably start to do, we're looking at, you know, in the middle finger, 30 to 40 percent of your body weight compressed and borne on about a centimeter square surface okay worse yet when we're in this situation here okay we have the the tendon pulling this one down and essentially in the same situation here where is force in one direction there has to be a, a counter force in the opposite we're getting what we class as a shear happening here okay which means that these two surfaces aren't just perfectly pushing up against each other anymore. We have a bally surface pushing on a sockety surface, but it's all going into, let's use a different color. It is all happening in this top corner here, okay? All right, now we've got this really strong resilient joint, but being loaded in a tiny little area. So a lot of force, small area, and made worse by the fact that we've got a growth plate here and this tiny weeny little bit of distance here is super vulnerable, okay? With repetition, that breaks, this sits higher, the finger doesn't straighten, it hurts, we don't climb very well. We can kind of keep climbing because it doesn't hurt that much, it's one of like 10 fingers, but what that's doing for your long-term health is can be catastrophic, okay? This injury, you will always get warning signs. Almost always, okay? All right, when you're like, oh yeah, my finger's a little bit grumbly, you stop, okay? We'll go through what to do when these, when these sort of aches and pains come. But nine times out of 10, we get warning signs here, okay? Some of those warning signs aren't necessarily the pain, but some of them are just like common sense. Like, oh, I've just started to do heaps more. I've just gotten heaps stronger. I just grew. All of these things that could be contributing to that um, that bucket of tolerance or bucket of resi resilience. Another factor on that was rapid increase in body size, which happens through adolescence. Okay, so that's our growth plate injuries, all right? Any questions at all? Yes? What was your name? So Anouk's question was, can you get an injury from crimping too hard um, as opposed to repetition? 
Most certainly, yeah. If we are, if we're doing anything that is over and above what our body is used to and habituated to, we're at risk of injury. And that would be an incident where it might come on a little bit more quickly, um, and we might notice that oh, one session, okay, that's a little bit, bit funky. That is the point where you stop, definitely, and get it looked at. Okay, when when we have that kind of pain come on, we go to a doctor, get ask them, I want an X-ray. I know like the procedure is that I get an X-ray on this type of thing, or you check in with a physio, who if you present with this sort of knuckle pain, will probably first step say, cool, you're not going to climb, get the X-ray, come back, we'll have a look at it, and we'll make a decision from that point. If that if the X-ray says there's a fracture there, it's like a blanket ten weeks off. Okay. That we just kind of go, all right, well, let's just assume this happened yesterday. You are having 10 weeks off. In a similar sort of manner to if you fractured your arm, we are going to immobilize it and not do anything on it because that's not going to heal very well. Okay. If the x-ray came back and it didn't have a fracture, then we'd go, whoa, good job. You've caught this at that really critical point where it's stressed out, but it hasn't yet had a structural failure. And then we would still take some time off but we would probably get back to it on a more of a symptom-based approach. So we'd look at, how does it feel next week? How do, well, rather, I'd probably look at it in three weeks and say, how does it feel in three weeks' time? So, oh, that's not painful anymore, okay. Well, let's, after having talked to you a lot about what you had been doing, we'd kind of return to climbing in a logical way, okay, and probably pull back a little bit from the crimping. The plus side of that would be that we might find out that your preference is to crimp. Whenever a hard move comes up, you wrap the thumb and do it. You're like, ah. Oh, well, what would happen if we started to train your pinch and your half crimp in your open positions? You would have more tools in your toolkits. Any other questions at all? Okay, so Hugo's question was, how do you know if you're overtraining your fingers? Um, you, there's two ways. One is theoretical and one is based on symptoms, okay? Theoretical is if, if you have started to do something that is more than kind of 10% more challenging, either in intensity or volume, you are already overtraining it, okay? And that's where working with someone external is really critical because that person is going to be looking at your overall volume and overall intensity um, and know whether that's a smart thing to do or not, okay? The other side is based on symptoms. If you're feeling, feeling an ache that isn't just kind of like, you know, disappearing within half a day, um, then that's definitely overtraining. If you're feeling an ache that's there for only half a day, then you got to make sure that next session that's not happening again. Okay, all right. Especially at a young age. All right, um, the tissues are heaps more vulnerable to longer-term injuries when we're younger. Yep. Um, it can be, um, but it would be far more rare. And I actually see it in people who are progressing toward like whatever middle ages like you know so basically well past skeletal maturity and it's actually a um an iteration of degeneration like ra i really want to say it's um long-term load adaptation um so it looks a bit more like osteoarthritis if we were to label it like that it's a little bit more rare in younger people um usually the hyperextension doesn't cause bone injury, it causes a soft tissue tensioning or tractioning injury down the bottom and it will pull a bit of bone off. Um, you know, because the growth plate is there, it plucks it off. And it happens, but it's rarer. Uh, okay, yeah, so little mental break. We're gonna now talk about pulley injuries. These happen pretty equally in kids and adults, okay? All right, and so I talked before about what the pulley is. The pulley is a soft tissue structure so we can kind of think of it as like a piece of seatbelt webbing, which restrains the flexor tendon to the bone, okay? Without it, this tendon would make a beeline for the tip and we wouldn't really be able to, our fingers wouldn't work very well, okay? It's like a fishing rod with its little eyelets. If we didn't have those eyelets, it wouldn't function the way we want it to function, okay? If we think about this, this system here, wanting it to be super strong, wanting to be able to hang one arm on an edge in this position, the structures that restrain those flexor tendons to the bone need to be absolutely bomb-proof, okay? The thing is though, when we do novel things, sometimes they are overloaded, okay? And we would typically see them fail, okay? And these do fail. These don't usually come on gradually, okay? People like to think, oh yeah, it's only minor, but 
minor or severe is only measured by the size of the of it okay all right and so you have some tearing with this injury it's almost always the case that there is some tissue failure okay this is not a a sore muscle it's not a yeah it's it's not a sore back this is some sort of tissue failure and it even if there is some slight sensitization of these tissues it's safer to think of it as a, some tissue failure okay this happens again in the half crimp position or full crimp position because there's a really big t corner that's turned by the flexor tendon which puts a lot of load on the very on this edge of the a2 pulley or this edge of the a4 pulley the a3 is occasionally injured as well but far less commonly so that's why i've simplified this because nine times out of ten it's a2 or a4 okay can anyone guess why this happens the forces your arrows right? like, yeah. yeah yep so yeah the force is involved and basically it's like okay so tissue breaks as we talked about earlier because we've done something that we haven't been habituated to okay so more crimping than usual um, more climbing than usual a sudden heavy load in a position that we're not familiar with a really awkward hold or something like that okay cool so that is our pulley injuries all right um, i won't go through management of these because it really does vary for different people okay um, not because the injuries vary that much but simply because what someone can do with an injury varies some people can't pick up a coffee cup some people can climb and do everything except certain group positions and so we will adjust their management based on that all right any questions on pulley injuries at all has anyone had one yes okay cool okay quick question how long has it taken you guys i'll get ask all of it jason how long has yours taken to to come good jason said six months after it happened it was he wasn't just back but he was ahead of where he was okay and that is often the case with injuries because it's an opportunity to reassess and change our approach yeah Pete uh, I was back in August so it's quite literally just started coming yeah okay so that's yeah we're looking at six months Denby I was back on the wall in two ways yep I wasn't back to the strength yet. yep so classic example of someone who probably had a high tolerance when they had the injury so it was someone who may have been able to continue climbing in some capacity, but one year, that's reeks of probably not amazing management, okay? And, and good, good loading within sort of the three to five month range is usually what we'll see. For someone who's had a severe one, they might be going back to training on a crimp or training on a half crimp hard, really hard at five months. Um, someone who had one that had a higher tolerance to begin with, maybe three months. Okay, um, but yeah, yours probably landed in what should have been a three month time frame. Okay, and that's where management is critical. I think we've kind of answered this, but I like, I really think if there's a take home that we can have today, it's like, how do we avoid these two injuries and even injuries in general? We, we manage the amount that we do, okay, and we manage the progression in which we, or the rate of progression that we use, okay something that I've wrote, written down because it's a lot more concise than I can bang out um, off the top of my head. A couple of like more definitive things that you can kind of do to avoid, okay, is that we can avoid doing the same type of training more than two times in a week, okay? Whether that's strength, whether it's bouldering, whether it's fingerboarding, there is almost no point in doing the same session more than twice a, w twice a week because it's, we need the time to recover. And climbing being a complex sport, you should be training a lot of different things. The three cornerstones of training for climbing, especially those of you who are root climbing, should be movement skill, okay? Okay, which is probably best done bouldering or root climbing, but bouldering is probably the best, okay? Thing is, bouldering also couples as your specific strength training, okay? So it's two birds with one stone. The next one would be endurance, okay? Even for the boulderers, working on volume at a lower level is really really important okay um so that might be done with lower intensity boulder problems or it might be done on roots okay still because it's sport specific the opportunity is there to train our movement as well okay finally and probably least important in terms of specificity but most important in terms of structural adaptation is our strength training so fingerboarding pull-ups rows and our antagonist muscles okay
So we kind of hit all with our pull-ups in our rows which are relevant to climbing, okay? Um, our bouldering should be ticking a lot of the other boxes and then our antagonist work is kind of covering the stuff that Justine is looking to flag with her screen. I say, okay, someone can't do this. Uh, or, you know, their total amount of rotation is out. That needs to be worked on specifically. If someone's squat, if they can't squat down into a deep squat, especially at a young age, that's something that probably needs to be worked. If someone can't take their arms overhead, that needs to be addressed. Um, but it's not sport-specific performance strength training, okay? So we do need to do, separate some of that antagonistic rehab prehab type work from sport specific strength okay so i said fingerboarding and pull-ups okay <laughs> almost and pull-ups aren't just this pull-ups are everything from you know wide pull-ups i mentioned rows offset pull-ups all sorts of things we can imagine okay um how else do we avoid that we train all the grip positions in all of those different methods of training fingerboarding bouldering endurance base work um, consistency, we don't take a week off, we don't take a month off, you know, maybe once a year we can have two to four weeks off for something, you know, as a bit of a break, but generally we want to keep consistent. Yep. Okay, so yeah, what is most important when we have a finger injury though? Um, any, any ideas? Yes, okay, so diagnosis is one. Okay, so diagnosis is really, really critical and that is where, I guess, either a hand physiotherapist or a climbing orientated physio is very very helpful because they understand the nitty-gritty details of tissues which most physios you know shy away from yeah whereas most climbers who are physios like you know that's the first page of their first year anatomy textbook that they open to okay all right um, yeah so diagnosis from someone who knows what they're doing um, that person hopefully also manages the acute stage where we want to offload tissues to allow the early stages of healing to happen unloaded and then the gradual return to sport specific activity okay um, so people often ignore their pain assume it'll go away and get caught up in their day-to-day -day training wanting to kind of focus on what's happening on the weekend or you know their next project or the next upcoming competition and they'll kind of go oh maybe this will just kind of go away in the case of the fingers, it is extremely rare that that happens, okay? So get it checked out sooner, get onto that process where you are starting to actually manage it well. So we stop at the first sign of, what, of something going wrong. All right, so I think often, a little bit of a mental break for a second. Um, quite often, when we're talking about injuries, it's very easy to kind of think about it from a really injury pathological point of view. But it's probably really important to like, think about it optimistically and just remember how amazing the body is and what it's actually doing. Even if one small link in that chain sort of shows some sign of weakness, that chain is still pretty amazing with what it does. Okay, so bear in mind that like, our, our bodies are built to get stronger, all right? The, when we stress the body harder than it's been stressed before or for longer than it's been stressed before, we adapt and become better at the tasks that we've trained, okay? And that is what underpins how we train. All right, but it's the same mechanism at play that is keeping us from getting injured. So we've just got to make sure that our training for performance is also ticking the box of building the strength in the tissues, all right? Um, if there's a take home message from today, it's about, it's that good training is injury prevention, okay? What does a good fingerboarding plan look like? I talked about what encompasses a good week okay we don't kind of overdo any one aspect of training but we always tick the boxes none of those boxes need to be ticked 10 times okay it's more about more important to tick those boxes 50 times over the course of six months okay because the body if you train at 80 percent okay the body will adapt all right especially if the 80 percent is more than you know last year's 75 percent you will adapt to that you don't need to go to 85 percent to actually create a training stimulus, all right? So we only need to do the bare minimum of each of those boxes to actually get progress, all right? And if we're ticking all of our boxes, then that we're doing a hell of a lot more than probably 95% of the climbers that I see. They focus in on one box and try and tick it 10 times a week, as opposed to ticking 10 boxes one or two times a week, okay? So just reducing down to a fingerboard session right now. Does anyone fingerboard? So we're looking possibly a third to half of the audience, all right? Okay, it's not necessarily for everyone, okay? And it's not essential, okay, to kind of 
to train well or anything like that. But it is a very nice systematic way to, to do something when maybe our training demands are quite diverse, especially if we're a young youth climber who's wanting to do all the disciplines. Fingerboarding is probably a good little thing to add in because your bouldering may not tick every box, okay? Um, really, really simple parts of this are that this is not a personalized plan. This is a disclaimer. Okay, if you're unsure about how to implement something, just don't, don't bother. Just go see someone and go, look, I just want a really rudimentary plan that it's not going to hurt me, that I can do for, you know, maybe four, ideally more like eight weeks, and I can then we'll kind of come back and we'll fine tune it. That person may charge you some money to do that, but it is money well spent. And if you separate the dollars spent over every session, over eight weeks, doing twice a week, that's 16. You can divide that total sum by 16. It looks like a bargain, okay? All right, and what you'll get from one-on-one -on -one, um, coaching and advice around this stuff is so much more than any, and I say any, online program can give you, even if it comes from the most reputable source because it's not personalized. So, massive disclaimer, but my general rules are one to two days a week, so we've got consistency, okay? Three different grip types, so we've got diversity, intermittent hang program, so we're, we're basically putting the brakes on intensity, okay, because when we do a hang, have a very short rest, let's say seven seconds of re work, three seconds rest, seven seconds of work, three seconds rest, we do that for six times. Basically, we need to be strong enough at the start to be able to do the sixth repetition, which means that we're not working really, really hard until we're starting to get a bit fatigued. Okay, so that controls intensity. And for youth climbers, and for anyone who is not familiar with fingerboarding, that is the only way that I would ever advise fingerboarding to be done um, and as I said before you don't need to work hard if something's novel you'll get gains okay um, we don't push to failure we don't fall off a fingerboard the way we fall off a bold problem okay we kind of we think about it from an effort level point of view zero to ten effort we don't need to be working at ten we don't need to be working at nine um, working around seven or eight that is pretty much what we're after um, so yeah aim for seven or eight out of ten effort level Every four weeks, we have an easy week. An easy week isn't sitting on the couch eating burgers. An easy week is doing the same structure with about half the volume and pulling the intensity back a little. Depending on the time of year and upcoming competitions, we might class this easy week, usually it would be two, as a tape up as opposed to an easy week. And we might maintain the intensity, but we pull back the volume, okay? Details that your, a coach or someone can help you with. Um, changing the plan every four to eight weeks. Okay, the body is amazingly adaptive. Okay, it won't keep adapting unless you change the stimulus. Okay, four weeks is a bit soon for strength. It's a pretty good time frame for something that's super novel and high intensity, but that would only really relate to adults. Eight weeks is much, much more realistic. Okay, last thing I wanted to say is that I said it at the start injuries can happen for really, really good reasons and really obvious reasons, but they can also happen just as a matter of bad luck, okay? We, we almost will be injured in life, whether it's climbing, whether it's just bad luck walking around the streets, this is what happens, okay? And the more we do put ourselves in situations where we challenge ourselves physically, okay? you a runner, you might encounter an injury, okay? We still benefit from, the, from being, leading an active lifestyle, okay? The big difference between you know, getting injured and managing it well and getting injured and ignoring it and sort of disregarding what you're feeling is the performance that you see in six months or 12 months. If you get injured and you manage it well from that day one, that more often than not is a, is a point where people make a significant leap in their climbing because it's an opportunity to reflect on what they're doing and get some insights often from a professional or often just through the process of personal reflection, which allows you to take that next leap in your climbing. Okay, so see, see injuries as an opportunity. Yes, we try to avoid them, but they will happen. Manage them well. That's it. Any questions at all? Jason had a good question that is definitely very relevant, and that is that, as I said before, hard climbing, especially if you're a climber in the Blue Mountains, um, really necessitates being strong in our half crimp or full crimp, okay? At climbing on moon board, climbing on a steep board here, okay, the holds will inherently be in cut and shallow and the harder you climb, the more so that is the case, okay? So it, 
Jason's question was that because we want to train specifically for the for our goals, we need to kind of emphasize that work. And that is really, really true because our gains made in training are, re are specific to what we practice, okay? So we just need to stick to the same principles. And that is that we look at what we have been doing, okay? And then next step forward needs to respect the parameters of progress, which is, you know, roughly 10%. So if you, over the last six months, you've been extremely consistent in your fingerboarding and bouldering, and your total time under tension, so time spent hanging, has been, let's say, let's say it's been two minutes per hand, per session, two days a week, almost every week. So we're starting to, we need to quantify this stuff. The step up from that would be, okay, well, maybe I'll go up one effort level and keep the volume the same, or maybe I'll keep the effort level the same and go up 10% in time under tension per session, okay? That's for the fingerboarding, it's easy to quantify. We can do a similar thing with the bouldering. It's like, cool, I try, let's say, I have 20 to 30 attempts on maximum level boulder problems in a session with quite big rests, last for you know one to one and a half hours of high level work. Okay, progressing that, we don't necessarily do it more frequently because you might already be doing it two days a week, that's enough. Okay, you need, to, need the time to recover from that, especially if you're doing supplementary stuff. The way that we progress that is we go, all right, what is my goal to get stronger? And more and do more of that hold type or is my goal does my goal involve doing more of that and then you know your progress is basically answered by that question and that is actually I'm falling off pumped on those little holds I might focus on doing more volume so more attempts and for practicality purpose bring the rest time down that would be cool because one way is preventing you from taking a big leap in intensity but if it was just that I just can't do the moves on the routes I want to try and I've done everything at the level I'm at and I've got a really wide base, that's where you might go, all right, well, I might focus my efforts on more problems that have holds like the, my project. But with respecting kind of the overall loading, we might actually reduce the overall volume. So it might be a shorter session. We might have bigger rests. We might make sure we're going into that session fresh. Um, all of these things where we... We, where, where you take from somewhere else and load the body harder than it's been loaded before, we need to, you know, give somewhere else and not push it in another way. Yeah. So we can't just suddenly go, boom, I'm making my fingerboard harder, I'm making my boulder harder, and I'm going to add some endurance, I'm going to add a bit of running, and P.S., um, I'm doing a hell of a lot of overtime at the moment to save for a trip. Okay? That is, that is the recipe for bombing that bucket. Okay?